including as the Associate Program Director at the Parnassus site of the Adult Psychiatry Residency Training Program, or as the Associate Medical Director of our Adult Outpatient Teaching Clinics, or as the Associate Director of our Program in Psychiatry and the Law. Um, he has such a wealth of knowledge and experience, and I'm really excited that we can all be here to learn from him today. Dr. Chamberlain, do you want me to go to your office and you can talk into my phone as the microphone or do you want to use your own phone as a microphone? Oh, oh there you go. Oh, am I unmuted? Wow, okay. How exciting. Okay. Well, uh, thank you all for coming. And um, obviously, uh, kind of a, whoops, fascinating situation here with um, trying to uh, get the technology going. Um, let me see if I can uh, do a quick share screen. Um, oops. Uh, okay. Let me try this again. Um, okay. Sorry, I promise I am not this clumsy normally, although generally not much better. Um, okay. okay, sorry. So we will be ready to go here. Um, whoops, and... Okay, can everyone see hopefully a slideshow? All right, I'm gonna go with Dr. Lear's thumbs up and Anha or Anya. Um, okay, so I will try to make up for some time. So basically, uh, just as some background, make sure we're all on the same page. Medical malpractice is not the equivalent of a patient being displeased with the kind of treatment you give them or the results of treatment. So it's not simply, hey, I gave you an antidepressant and you would have preferred this one that I did CBT versus DBT for you, something like that. It basically is another way of saying that the medical provider, whether psychiatrist, psychologist, nurse, um, other provider, was negligent in either providing treatment or in making um, a diagnosis. And basically they have to show that the plaintiff, which can be the actual patient, it could be their estate or their representative if they're, for example, deceased, um, has to demonstrate that the provider, the person who is treating them, cause them some harm that a competent provider, physician would not have caused under similar circumstances. So that this is the concept of falling below the standard of care. You don't have to provide perfect care. You don't even have to provide the best care, but you have to be reasonably careful and competent in how you deliver your care. That's the requirement of the law. Um, so 
let's skip that reiteration of it. So anyone who can identify this image, I'm, I'll be quite impressed, but um, the code of Hammurabi from 1750 BCE or so has one of the first descriptions of medical malpractice. Um, it's a little bit harsh, but if a doctor has treated a gentleman with a lancet of bronze and has caused the gentleman to die or has opened an abscess of the eye and has caused the loss of that eye, one shall cut off his hands. So a little bit harsh, but it gets the point across that if you fall below the standard of care, you're not allowed to practice medicine anymore. Um, now, despite the fact that I am an associate medical director and one of the program directors in RTP, we do not hold residents to this standard. Um, although I might have to revisit that at times. Um, so the more modern concepts really start coming out in English common law following the Battle of Hastings for those who are interested in history. So Everard versus Hopkins from 1164, a physician had to pay damages to a master and servant due to practicing unwholesome medicine. It's not entirely clear what that was. A um, couple centuries later, um, a surgeon, Mr. Swanlund, was supposed to treat Agnes of Stratton's mangled hand. The treatment was unsuccessful, it was apparently just as bad after as it was before. So they sued uh, the surgeon for breach of contract. And the case was dismissed because of an error in filing the paperwork, which somehow seemed very modern to me and made me kind of like laugh a little bit, but um, that paperwork is still important 700 years later. But despite the fact that the case was actually dismissed, the Chief Justice did make some comments that contributed to the modern conception of malpractice. And one was that you have to be negligent in order to be held liable for any harm that you cause for it to be malpractice. And that if you followed the appropriate standard of care, if you practiced in a reasonable and prudent way, even if you didn't cure the patient, you didn't get the desired outcome, you still wouldn't be found liable for malpractice. Um, they start, uh, the era of what I do, expert witnesses starts during the reign of Charles V and in 1532 when a law was passed that required medical professionals to provide opinions in cases involving violent death. Um, the commentaries of the laws of England by Sir William Blackstone come out in 1768, and he coins this idea of malapraxis in Latin, which is professional negligence. And he sort of, he basically says, this breaks the trust which the party had placed in his physician and tends to the patient's destruction. Subsequently, in the next uh, few hundred years, malpractice replaces malapraxis, which I don't know, I kind of like going back to the old days. But in terms of what we now look at in terms of modern US law malpractice, we have this heritage that we kind of quickly ran through, but now it's often referred to as the four Ds of malpractice are what you have to show if you're going to be sued, suing someone. One, there is a duty to the patient. So you've established a relationship with the patient, you are required to provide them competent care. There has to be dereliction of that duty. That dereliction has to directly lead to damages. So duty, dereliction, directly damages are the four Ds. And if you can't prove all four of these, then malpractice didn't happen. So for example, 
I'm a surgeon, I show up to the operating room intoxicated, but Dr. Zhang like intercepts me because she realizes that I'm intoxicated and she kicks me out of the OR before I do anything. And then she finds a substitute or she does the operation herself and things go well. Even though I have a duty to the patient, I'm clearly derelict in my duty by showing up to operate intoxicated. There were, that did not directly cause any damage to the patient because someone else did their procedure. And even if I had done the surgery and muddled through, if there were not any damages, then I would still not have committed legally malpractice. I might have I might get in trouble for a lot of other things, but at least I wouldn't be on the hook for malpractice. So the plaintiff in these cases has to show that there was a doctor, patient, provider, patient, physician, patient, however one would like to say it, relationship that had been established. Um, if you have seen someone and started to provide treatment, clearly there is such a relationship. Um, other end of the spectrum, you overhear someone giving advice at a party and you follow that advice and have a bad outcome, that person at the party did not have a treatment relationship with you so you could not sue for malpractice um, because you just sort of listened in on something. Um, now, it can be complicated in between these two extremes. For example, is a curbside consultation, kind of an informal consultation. Hey, uh, Dr. Lear, I have this patient with depression and I'm wondering about like this strategy to intervene. Has she actually, has Dr. Lear actually established a relationship? She's like giving information about the patient, but how, how much of a relationship has been established could be argued. If the patient calls up the clinic and is seeking treatment, what kind of interaction did they have there? It can be complicated to sort of say like, when did treatment relationships get established? Um, and if you're on an acute service, like an inpatient unit or consultation liaison service, PHP, IOP, if the person gets discharged, the moment they get discharged, is that when your relationship with them ends? Does it survive that ending, that discharge for some period of time? And if so, how long? These are questions that we often find ourselves debating. In terms of dereliction of duty, we go to the standard of care which is very simply the level at which the average prudent provider in a given community would practice. So again, doesn't have to be perfect, doesn't have to be the best, has to be average. So this is often the province of expert witnesses to come in and determine what would be the standard of care. Like, okay, that's not how I would have done it. And I don't think it's great, but it's good enough um, or not. Um, it's also been described as how similarly qualified practitioners, so people of similar training and education, would have managed the patient's care under the same or similar circumstances. So you have two cardiologists. How would they have managed this? It's not a cardiologist saying, like, well, this is what a primary care physician should have done. They should have, like, practice like I, the cardiologist with all this extra training should have done. Um, so they have to fall below or breach the applicable standard of care. Um, and that is the same as showing that they were negligent in the care that was provided. And again, the expert witnesses come in directly so even if you fall below the standard of care, like I was pointing out, there has to be harm for there to be malpractice. And that harm has to stem from the dereliction in duty. I show up drunk to the operating room. I do the surgery. The patient 
has a fall on the unit because somebody waxed the floor and didn't put up the sign, that's sure their wound tore open and stuff, but that's not because of my operating drunk. It's because they had a fall. So there's not malpractice. There might be other, again, issues that come up, but that's not malpractice. Um, now, it can be hard with the directly part, though, because often these patients, they're seeing people in medical settings. Why? Because they're ill. So they might have had an injury. They might have been ill before they got treatment from the defendant. And there could be questions about, well, how do you know that this came from what the defendant physician did as opposed to someone else did? How do you know this wasn't the underlying disease? You know, like, yeah, this person like had all these problems after the chemotherapy I gave them, but they were probably going to have many of these same problems, if not all of them without the chemotherapy. So the natural course of the disease would explain this. And again, this is where you have expert witnesses trying to determine if there's a direct link in causation. Um, the plaintiff has the burden of proving these things if they bring a claim and they have to prove it by a so-called preponderance of the evidence. So if you're in a criminal case, the standard of proof is beyond a reasonable doubt. We've all heard that term and that's like 90 or 95% certain that this is the case that the person did it. Preponderance is really just more likely than not. 51% or more likely that it was the, the malpractice happened, you know, that this directly led to damages. That's the standard that they have to prove. And the reason it's so much lower than in a criminal case is because it's involving money, not the deprivation of the defendant's liberty. So if you're looking at throwing someone in jail or prison, you have to be a lot more certain than just if you're taking away money from them. Again, you have to suffer damages. So possible damages could include things like inability to work, loss of or decreased earning capacity, death, obviously a big one, suicide, suicide attempts, harm to others. So like I don't do a proper risk assessment, the person has homicidal ideation and they go out and attack someone. Um, mental anguish, further medical costs because they have to undergo additional treatment to make up for what I did, could be pain. Um, people will come up with lots of different potential ones. Some common scenarios that can get us into trouble, failure to diagnose. Um, so this can come up if they, can show that a physician who adhered to the appropriate standard of care would have recognized the illness. Like, hey, this is obviously not depression. This person had a history of depression, that's true, but had a history of manic episodes. So you should have asked about that. You should have recognized that that's a bipolar disorder, not unipolar depression, as an example. Um, it can also come up with not that you just missed the diagnosis or made the wrong diagnosis, but if someone else who was following the standard of care would have made a different diagnosis and that would have resulted in a better outcome than they had gotten, that could also be malpractice. So you could say, well, I diagnosed the person with um, let's say depression, but it was really PTSD. And if I had actually then instituted appropriate treatments for PTSD, like Prazosin to help with sleep at night, uh, cognitive processing therapy or something else, they would have gotten better a lot faster. Their function would have been restored or gotten to a higher level. That would be theoretically a grounds for malpractice under failure to diagnose. Improper treatment, you can either give a treatment that 
is below the standard of care that other competent providers never would give. Um, hey, I'm going to treat your bipolar disorder with some high dose stimulants or um, trying to think of things I've heard in the community, hot tub therapy for your depression, um, which is apparently a thing in the community. Um, or if you give a reasonable intervention, but then you do it in a way that's below the standard of care. So like I give um, Dr. Lear like ECT for her depression, but I forget to anesthetize her or paralyze her. Yeah, give 1940s or 1950s ECT in the 2020s, that would be malpractice. Um, another one is, and this happens a lot, is failure to provide informed consent. So you have to discuss what with your patients or if applicable, an alternative decision maker. What are the risks of treatment? What are the benefits of treatment? Um, what are the alternatives? And you also have to include what are the risks of no treatment? So if you decide to not have any treatment, if you have decision-making capacity, you can certainly do that, but you have to, as a provider, document that you explain to the person what could happen. Like, if you don't have these laboratory monitoring studies this is what I'm concerned about. You don't let me do an AIMS test for tardive dyskinesia. You could develop this and it could be quite pronounced before we try to intervene. And that makes it less likely that we could address it effectively. Um, now, what will often happen is they'll say, okay, if you take a patient who got the right information, the appropriate information, they would have made a different choice or chosen to forego the treatment, for example, that could be, again, grounds for malpractice. Um, so not everybody is at the same risk of malpractice across the spectrum of medical specialties. This is a 2011 study from the New England Journal of Medicine, and basically what they found is they looked at tens of thousands of providers for 14 years, um, hundreds of thousands of patient, of provider years of insurance, and they looked and the average was every year about 7.4% of the physicians got involved in a medical malpractice claim. 22% of those resulted in a payment having to be made. So 1.6% of the physicians had a claim that resulted in payment against them. Um, but it varied markedly by specialty. So psychiatry, yay, mental health was down at 2.6% per year. Um, but neurosurgery was 19.1%. Cardiothoracic surgery was like 18.9%. Family practice was around 5%. So it varies a lot what your risks are. And most of the procedural specialties where they're cutting on people, not surprisingly, have the highest rates of getting sued. Um, the average payment amount, 117800 for dermatology, up to 521000 for pediatrics. So also how much payment varied based on what specialty you were in. And the authors estimated that by the time you get to 65, 75% of physicians in low risk specialties will have been involved in a lawsuit for medical malpractice. So like, even if you're a psychiatrist, low risk, 75%, same age, 99% of people who who work in the high risk specialties will have been involved in a medical malpractice claim. And this is where I think people sort of in the more casual way say, it's not a matter of if, but when you will be involved in a medical malpractice claim. And if you keep practicing long enough, it's gonna happen. I know that was fun news to hear. Um, this is just a visual representation of it. You can sort of see green is any claim um, annually, the percentage of providers 
who have a claim against them. Orange is how off the percentage that resulted in payment. So you can see psychiatry looks good. We have a very small percentage of people getting sued and a really small percentage of people having to make payments. But you can see as you get into like surgeries, it's clearly double digits along with OBGYN um, and urology. Uh, it kind of comes down and here's the all physician sort of average. Abandonment, the other topic for today, is simply a category of malpractice. And again, plaintiff has to prove their accusations. It's again, this preponderance of an evidence, more likely than not, this was the case. Um, there has to be an actual relationship. So the doctor has to have agreed to provide treatment to a patient and the treatment must have started for, the, for abandonment to happen. Also, the plaintiff, the patient has to prove that the end of the relationship happened at a point when there was a need for ongoing treatment, a so-called critical stage of the treatment. And the circumstances around how the treatment relationship ended has to be below the standard of care. So in other words, that the provider was negligent in how they ended things. Um, they have the end has to have deprived the patient, for example, of having adequate resources and time to locate an appropriate replacement provider. The person's out in a very rural area. It's hard to find someone. I tell them I'm going to give you just enough meds for a week. Get out of my office. I don't want to see you anymore. And they don't have adequate resources to go traveling around to find where's the next provider, for example. Um, again, there have to be damages and there has to be a direct causation between the end of the relationship and those damages. So the standard of care is often put as would an average competent physician with similar training have ended the treatment relationship in the same manner as well as at the same time in light of the patient's need for treatment? And if you say like, boy, well, you know, Dr. Chamberlain's kind of quick on the draw and he fires all these patients, is that the standard of care or would like say Dr. Binder and Dr. Lear and Dr. Zhang would say like, no, come on. That's like, you can't just fire people for, I don't know, wearing glasses, which would be odd as I internalize my anti-glasses hatred towards myself and then like project it on my patients. But those are the sorts of things that can happen. Um, some special cases, um, Dom Tarpy, I think was in the audience and this one goes out to Dom because he is always having to remind us of this one in acute services, but the EMTALA violations, the Emergency Medical Treatment and Active Labor Act deals with abandonment in the event of an emergency situation. It's federal law. Hospitals have to treat people who arrive with an emergent health condition without regard to ability to pay, citizen, citizenship, or immigration status. And if the person presents that way, the facility has to take all the reasonable steps to stabilize the person's status. Um, if you don't do that, you can be sued as a facility for the financial equivalent of the injury, as well as an additional $50,000 penalty, um, which doesn't make anyone happy. Another type of abandonment can be inadvertent. The physician forgets about the patient, loses track of the patient, they cancel a visit, and they disappear from your schedule. and you just are busy and you don't pick up that you haven't been seeing them for a while. Um, could be a computer glitch, an administrative issue. And there have been defendant physicians who have argued that if there's no intention to abandon the patient, I'm not trying to end the relationship, then I shouldn't be held liable 
for the abandonment and any issues that flow from that. But generally speaking, that defense is roundly rejected and physicians or other providers are expected to continue treatment until the patient has been appropriately released. A lot of these sort of use the term doctor, but I would just say like, think provider. Intentional abandonment may result in punitive damage being um, being imposed on the defendant as opposed to inadvertent abandonment unlikely to have punitive damages added on. So it's, it is worse to do it intentionally, but it doesn't help you a whole lot to do it inadvertently. Um, so one common scenario, transfer without proper instruction. So you have to end it at an appropriate time and in an appropriate manner in terms of the treatment. You can't just transfer to another provider. The new provider you know, probably is going to lack some familiarity with all the details of the treatment and the history. And so you have to have a continuing plan to provide relevant records and instructions to the new physician. Now, this doesn't go on forever, but, you know, you should make yourself available or be ready to refer them to medical records. And obviously, if someone retires, you're not going to be like trying to like pull them out of retirement to come back and talk about like further sign out. But within reason, you're expected to do these things. Failure to pay. You can't discharge someone only because they can't pay for treatment during a critical period. Um, if they're stable and you give them enough warning, then you can do it. Um, a 1990, 1989, sorry, Iowa case, this uh, surgical consultants versus ball uh, is an example of this kind of thing. Patient has a bariatric surgery, postoperatively gets a bunch of abscesses, um, keeps going back to the surgeon who did the surgery, has 11 visits where the surgeon's trying to treat them and then says, no more, you haven't paid your bill. I'm cutting you off, no more treatment. And the court decided this was not patient abandonment because the patient was no longer in a critical stage. They were sort of stable and had had the opportunity to get plenty of treatment and to pay their bill and did not. It was okay for the physician to end it. But you could imagine like if the surgeon said at the first visit, like, oh, you got all these abscesses, you should get someone to look at that. I'm sorry, but I'm not going to do it because you can't pay. That would have been abandonment. Um, unavailability. This is one that we definitely wrestle with, um, with institutions like UCSF where we have call, call schedules and stuff. If the physician is not available for an unreasonable duration at a time when the patient requires medical care and there's harm, as a result of that unavailability, that can be a cause for a suit under abandonment. It can also apply to a covering backup or on-call physician. So if the physician is taking call overnight and they don't get back to the patient, even though they may have never seen them before, they're covering, they can actually still be sued for abandonment. Um, other forms of abandonment, a healthcare facility with inadequate staffing can lead to accusations of patient abandonment, prematurely discharging someone. Um, if there was an important meeting or visit scheduled and the person doesn't show up and you don't reach out to them or contact them. Um, if the patient calls up with some kind of urgent question or inquiry for a doctor and the staff don't actually send it to the physician in a timely fashion, that can be abandonment. Or one that we struggle with a lot of times, I think, especially in COVID times and with the you know, huge demand that we see, scheduling a visit too far out. So like, hey, I don't have the ability to see you next month. It's going to be three months. 
that could be a problem. Um, there are a lot of valid reasons to end a treatment relationship. You don't have to just take everybody on forever. Um, and you can see some of those rationales here. You don't have the appropriate skills to treat them. The person needs a cardiologist and I'm not a cardiologist. I should not be treating the patient. And that's a reason to end it. They need a specialist. My facility doesn't have the resources or supplies to provide appropriate treatment. We are not a trauma center. Like, yes, the Pritzker building has a lot of physicians in it. We don't have the like medical tools to do a lot of treatments that someone theoretically could need. There might be legal or ethical conflicts that come up during the course of the treatment. The patient might violate your policies. They might be disengaged from treatment. They might not adhere to treatment recommendations. They might engage in inappropriate behavior, sexual advances, violence, verbal abuse, et cetera. And those can all be reasons that you do it. If there's a valid reason, there are some steps to take to end the relationship appropriately and minimize legal liability. One, provide written notice that the relationship is ending. And, you know, if you want, there's a little bit of a debate. You can provide the reason or not. We tend at UCSF to say, here's the reason. And I think that's actually a good plan. Um, provide ongoing treatment for a reasonable duration. You're being discharged from care. We're giving you three months supply of medications you can reach out to this provider for the next month. If there's something urgent beyond that, you would need to go to the emergency room and here are some other crisis resources. Um, provide recommendations for a qualified alternative provider. So I don't actually have to go out and track down the new provider for someone, um, but I have to like give them some information so it's not like i have to sort of say like hey um dr win will you please 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 take this patient on it's enough to say okay here's a list of providers from your insurance here's a list of um referral services zocdoc psychologytoday.com something like that um, and then transfer their medical records to the next provider in a timely fashion. So when we discharge people from UCSF clinics, we tend to say, here's the number that you call to get your medical records, and then they will make sure that they're transferred over to the new provider. And that's a good thing to do. So this is a couple of think about them vignettes. Um, Dr. Freud no relation to anyone you might have thought of, is consulted by an ER for a patient with depression, paranoid ideation, auditory hallucinations, suicidal thoughts, no actual history of attempts, doesn't have a current intent or plan, is hopeful that treatment can be beneficial, starts in antidepressant and any psychotic in the ER. Dr. Freud thinks he's appropriate for an IOP and sets a follow-up visit. The next day, Dr. Freud sees the patient, um, does his intake, says, I'm going to go find the administrator so they can schedule your visits into the IOP. Why don't you wait in the waiting room? Person looks around, sees a nice piece of artwork, decides no one's watching, and puts it in his backpack. They make plans for treatment when the administrator gets there, and the guy leaves. Um, Fortunately, we had a security camera. Dr. Freud calls the person up and says, hey, what about this missing artwork? Patient says, what? I don't know. Don't have any idea. That's too bad. Dr. Freud says, there's video footage that you took it. If you don't return it in the morning, we're going to file a police report. Patient comes in the next morning to start treatment. Doesn't bring the artwork. Dr. Freud contacts the police and files a report and he wants to immediately discharge the patient from IOP. <clears throat> Just something to think about, like, would that be 
appropriate at this time or would people have concerns you know like he's violated policy he's stolen stuff he's going to be involved in the criminal justice system but one could also say like hey this is a person who's got suicidal ideation and you felt like needed a high level of care might not be the time to discharge uh same fact scenario except the consulting psychiatrist is Dr. Erickson, and there's no theft of paperwork. But the patient comes in, he starts immediately challenging therapists in group, complains the first therapist can't understand him because he's a man, she's a woman, um, and just questions if the therapeutic interventions she's suggesting could, in, could be successful for men. The group appears divided. Some are critical of the patient and sort of chastise him for being disruptive. Others actually join in and also criticize the therapist, but they have a variety of other criticisms. Therapist sets appropriate limits. Um, there's no physical violence, name calling, or further disruptive behavior, but he challenges the group leaders in an ongoing way over the course of the first day. He also is still having all his same symptoms. His medications are still being titrated and he's, he doesn't want to go voluntarily into the hospital and he can't be put on a hold. Therapists are frustrated, understandably, and ask that he be discharged. Again, question, how would you advise them? What would you say? Like, is that abandonment? Um, he's certainly being a handful and a jerk, but like, we might have to wonder if now is an okay time to discharge. Um, basically, the underlying principle is if you accept a patient, you have to continue treatment until it's either done or the person can be transferred to an alternative provider. Legal or ethical challenges that the patient is dealing with don't change the analysis of whether or not patient abandonment has occurred. We often have to provide treatment to people who've done unpleasant, illegal, or antisocial things. And I think we generally understand we're not supposed to be the judge or jury, but it's difficult to work with them. And it's a good idea in cases like this to get consultation. Um, so turning back to medical malpractice, and what we can do around it. Um, the vast majority of claims in mental health for malpractice have to do with suicide in some way, despite like how many different things have been listed out there. Um, claims about inadequate follow-up treatment, assessment, you know, often involve cases where there's some level of suicidal behavior, either completed or attempted suicide. Um, you know, other kind of non-suicide related things, adverse reactions to medications, someone who's a danger to others, informed consent failures, violations of confidentiality, not monitoring laboratory results are much less common. Um, sexual relationships, just because this often comes up, are typically not covered by malpractice insurance. They're litigated is either a criminal offense, non-malpractice civil issue, or something against one's professional license. The caveat to that is that sometimes attorneys will make a strategic decision along with their clients to say, this isn't going to be covered by malpractice and the provider doesn't have like enough resources to make it worth our while to sue them for something else and they will sue for things like manipulation or misuse of the transference and they'll do something that's not got a criminal meaning and that allows them to sue under malpractice going for the so-called deeper pocket um how do you minimize risk Treat your patients the way you would want people you care about to be treated. Um, 
one of the articles said family members and I'm like, okay, well, maybe it's just my family, but like pick the people in your family that you like and treat them that way, how you want to be treated. Give them time during assessments, follow-up visits, when you're explaining the diagnosis and treatment plans, document, take time to document your findings and reasoning carefully to actually go and try to get the collateral information. You might not be able to get it for one reason or another, but you can at least document that you tried and you made the effort. Really understand, because it's such a common source of lawsuits in our fields, understand the principles of suicide risk assessment and how to manage suicide risk. Assess suicide risk regularly throughout treatment and really do a good job. Don't just say like no SI, um, that is not considered an adequate risk assessment. Um, if you're a psychiatrist, as one author put it, you have to be the doctor. So we play, as a psychiatrist, you play an important role in developing policies and procedures for healthcare facilities, your leaders on health teams, and whether or not it's fair, juries will often look at the psychiatrist or other doctoral level provider as the person who failed to protect the plaintiff, the patient from inadequate treatment. So like, hey, in spite of budgetary constraints or staffing constraints, you doctor so-and-so should have done more to protect this patient. Um, and we do have legal and ethical duties to ensure patient safety needs are, oops, I'm sorry, that should say met during treatment. Um, document your findings, your assessment, your reasoning. How did you do a risk assessment? What has changed for the patient? Don't just say no SI, no HI. Is the patient now involved in groups? They're now taking medication. They're talking on the phone. They're engaging in making future plans, et cetera. Um, if the medical record does not show clear evidence that you were engaging in appropriate reasoning and doing these things, juries and attorneys may simply decide that you didn't do those things. If it's not documented, it didn't happen. And when you try to testify about it months or years later, and after there has been a negative outcome, that's probably going to be less convincing to a jury than entries in the medical record made at the time. You have to be careful in applying factors that are protective at a group level to an individual. Um, Let's see, I'm gonna go through some of these strategies without going through the illustrative vignettes, vignettes just so we can finish. Um, get consultation on cases where there's complex questions or where you're not really sure. Don't rely on just the patient's self-report about suicidal behaviors and thoughts. Um, do not, and I cannot emphasize this enough, do not rely on no harm contracts when you're making decisions about admission, discharge, change in level of care, intense intensity of monitoring, they have no benefit whatsoever. They're not at all protective. The only benefit they arguably have is if someone won't contract for no harm, then that can be kind of predictive that they're at high risk, but nothing else is useful. Um, document, symptoms, function, behavior, and what circumstances have changed when you're making decisions about moving to less intensive monitoring, lower level of care, discharge, et cetera, um, to really show that you have an understanding of where the patient is at and that there is something that should be going on. If you cannot think of or document a meaningful change, you probably should avoid or at least be very, very careful about making changes in level of care, et cetera. Um, always assess the degree to which they are unpredictable and unstable. Um, 
really avoid trying to say that self injurious behavior or thoughts are minor or conditional that tends to like start bringing in a bias and it also looks really bad to attorneys or to the jury because I think Dr. Binder would say this would be the sort of thing that would be blown up to movie theater saw screen size in front of the jury like where they say like oh okay there's no risk well look what happened um do not falsify records that's always a good one to avoid try to request and if it's available review collateral information reach out and when you can get a hold of them communicate with people who can provide corroborating information about the person's status reach out to other providers um request regular follow-up reports from other members of the treatment team like hey let's check in every quarter let's check in every month um no the qualifications of other providers and to anyone that you're referring you know you don't want to pick a name out of the phone book and say like oh yeah this person will provide excellent care if you don't know them be cautious of doing that because you could be on the hook if they don't do a bad good job um and never ever assume that the family members no matter how much they love the person and how dedicated and sincere they are that they can ever watch people in a way comparable to what hospital staff can do on a inpatient unit it's just not realistic that patients are going to be at home in an uncontrolled environment with family members who can watch them 24 7 the way they would be in a hospital setting <sighs> deep breath sorry Wanted to get through all the slides and we did so um, at 2.03. If people need to go, I totally understand. Um, but um, I'm happy to stick around for a little bit in case people have questions. But I realize because of technical issues and getting started late, people might have to go and that's fine. I think so far the only questions in the chat are about getting a CME link. Gina, I'm not sure if you're able to send that back in the chat. And then I see Packer Rosenthal has their hand up. Um, do you need help unmuting? I will unmute you. Hi. I was wondering if you could comment on who owns session notes with the kind of new law. Um, if if a partner of a patient um, is requested to come in by the patient, can the partner also access the um, session notes? That's a great question. I I would say no. Um, the as long as you're doing the session is for the treatment of the patient and that's the focus of it then it's only going to be it's the patient's note and their confidentiality and their privacy um, if you were doing couples therapy or family therapy um, then all the members of the family or the couple would have equal um, ownership of the notes, but that would be, you know, charted in a different way. Does Thanks. that make um, sense? Yeah, I, I was just also wondering, this is at a VA agency in a, a rural area, and um, I, the, the um, therapist retired um, shortly after starting the therapy, and I'm the therapist of the significant other. And it would be really helpful for me to get those notes, but it feels like I'm not being able to find out even who the therapist actually is. Um, I mean, an agency should have to provide who the past therapist was, shouldn't they? Um, Dr. Bender, you were shaking your head. It looks like you might have a thought. Tiani, can you unmute Dr. Bender, please? Oh, 
thought I did. Let me try again. Okay. Um, I mean, if uh, generally speaking, the the confidentiality requirements like survive death, even. But, yeah. Right. Um, yeah. Oh. No one has a right to the records without the patient's consent. Agencies are not allowed to release it without the patient's consent. Yeah, that I, of course that, that yeah I know that <laughs> I should have remembered. Just um yeah how how can I can I help the significant other to reach yes. out to that agency? No, the significant other needs to contact the patient. Okay. And say you need to give you know consent so that my therapist can have access to the records because my therapist says that it would be very helpful to me. Okay. And so you need to give consent for them to release it. Thank you. Super. Yep. I would definitely agree. Dr. Lear, are you still on? Because I know you made me promise that you could ask your question, but she might have left and I can always go across the hall. Well, if no one else has questions, thank you very much for um joining again i'm sorry we had some technical snafus early on but i hope this was uh useful and i'm always available if people want to email me or reach out and happy to address um consultation questions about this stuff uh dr bender and dr zhang and i are all forensic psychiatrists so we all do a lot of this kind of work. Thanks, everybody. Have a good rest of your day.